so of all the uh, accolades we've heard, wonderful things we've heard about Barry, uh, uh, applied mathematics I don't think has been mentioned uh, in the first uh, bunch of talks. And the theme of this talk is the following. Um, anybody who does mathematics, um, uh, no matter how focused, no matter how abstract, runs into outsiders. And you know, you're at a faculty meeting, you're at a dinner, you're, and some chemist, a social scientist, oh, you're a mathematician, I have a question. You know, could I ask you, you know, and, and, and every once in a while, you get interested and do a little something, and, and some applied math comes out of it. Now, it, it, it's hard, of course, to, you know, how do you keep track of, of, of somebody's output in that dimension? And I'm going to take advantage of the fact that the, the, the outsider that asked Barry the things that I'm going to talk about is me. <laughs> so over a close to 50 year period, um, I, I've talked to Barry, and we, we're, 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 we're friends and talk about all kinds of things, but um, I, I tricked him, uh, whatever, uh, into thinking about uh, various things, and I'm going to tell you three of them. And these are three stories. Uh, the first is about uh, shuffling cards. And that's going to be my favorite story about stories. And uh, the second is um, about uh, the books of Plato. Uh, and the third is about walking on the streets of Paris. <laughs> And, um, okay, so most of my mathematical adventures start with some real-world problem. And uh, let me set the scene for uh, the, first, the, the first instance. So I was working at Bell Labs, and I was trying to figure out the optimal strategy in a certain card game. Uh, and it was much too complicated to solve or get to the end of it, and so we were doing it by simulation try to make certain choices and how many cards each point is worth and then have it play against itself and optimize that sort of thing. And so in order to do that, we needed lots and lots of, um, of uh, random permutations of 52 cards. Let me remind you how you generate a random ordering of a deck of cards. Um, I, uh, suppose you had 52 cards as memory registers or in a stack. Then you get the computer to generate a random number between 1 and 52, say 17, and you transpose cards 1 and 17. And then between 2 and 52, say 5, and you transpose 2 and 5. And then between 3 and 52, maybe 3, so you do nothing to 3, etc. So you do that, and assuming that the random number generator works, uh, or that you're happy with that, that generates a random permutation, right? Because any card can be on top, and then any card next, etc. Okay, so we ran the simulations, and um, they took, oh, I don't know, 30 hours of CPU time on big machines. So it was a lot of effort. And after it was all done, and we're looking at something was wrong. I don't know what does it mean something is wrong when you're looking at pages and pages of simulations, but something was wrong. Something wasn't monotone. And so we start looking at the code. I mean, there's no more pain. Than that, looking at somebody else's code. And, um, and after two days, I, I said to the lady, Marion Gatto, that, well, I, I'm desperate. How did you generate your random permutations? And she said, Oh, yeah, you said that fussy thing, transpose, you know, random with one random. She said, I made them more random. I transpose random with random. <laughs> and I said, Aha. <laughs> and I so you have to redo the simulations. You have to re re rerun the code. And she actually cried, I remember, and, uh, and uh, said, you know, but it can't make any difference. She went to her boss, and he went to his boss, and he came down and yelled at me, you mathematicians are crazy. You know, she did 100 random transpositions. That has to be enough to mix up 52 cards. And, uh, and so I really wanted to know the answer to the question, how many random transpositions does it take to mix up 52 cards? I mean, that, that's, the, that's the background for this story. And so just to put it in context, one, so, so you're with me. So suppose a deck of cards starts out on the table, one up to 52 in order. Card one, card two, 52. You pick a card at random with your left hand, you pick a card at random with your right hand, and you switch them. And you do that a lot, okay? 
And you're allowed, you allow your left hand to equal your right hand because otherwise there'd be a parity problem after an even number of switches, you'd be in an even permutation. And I want to know how many uh, transpositions does it take to mix up um, the cards. Uh, the, the, in my instance, the lady did 100. Uh, the first time that the bridge league went from hand shuffle cards to computer shuffle cards, they did 60 random transpositions, not knowing of the usual algorithm. You know, how many does it take? So let me make math of that for a second. Um, uh, so, um, uh, so I'm working on all permutations of, 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 of n is 52. Uh, and uh, uh, the probability thing that I just waved my hands about, uh, you could code it up this way. Uh, it's a probability distribution. The probability of a permutation sigma is, well, 1 over n if sigma is the identity. And it's 2 over n squared if sigma is a transposition and zero otherwise. That's uh, my basic step in my switches. And, um, and then repeated transpositions we model as, as, um, as convolution. So I write it down just for a second, p star p of sigma. Um, the chance of being at a given arrangement of a deck of cards after shuffling twice is equal to the sum of p of eta p of, I guess it's sigma eta inverse. Um, here summed over eta. So that's just ordinary convolution. And, um, uh, and uh, p star k of sigma is the chance of being at the arrangement sigma after k switches. So there I've written it down. Um, and then there's the uniform distribution, u of sigma, um, uh, which is 1 over n factorial, all permutations equally likely. And I want to know how large this, well, Poincaré actually was the first one to show uh, in the 1890s that uh, p star k uh, uh, converges to u. Um, let's see, let's see what, uh, as, as when k gets large, which just says if you shuffle a deck of cards a lot, it gets all mixed up. Uh, <laughs> and you already knew that. And I want to know how fast. And so in order, to, um, in order to tell you that, I have to say one more definition. Stop for a second, too. And, um, uh, and so the distance between shuffling k times and uniform, uh, we, this is one good way of defining it. Uh, p star k of a minus u of a. Um, and uh, maximum. A and SN. And so here's what this says. A is some set of arrangements of a deck of cards. Maybe all arrangements of a deck of cards with the ace of spades is in the top half. And uh, P star K of A is what's the chance that the deck is in that set of arrangements after K shuffles. U of A is if the cards are perfectly mixed. What's the chance? You take the difference between those two numbers, and then you take the worst case of that. That's the distance that we often use, total variation. And, um, uh, and with all of this specified, there's now a math problem, finally. Uh, uh, given epsilon bigger than 0, how large k? So, so that the distance of shuffling to uniform um, is is less than epsilon. That's a, that's now a math problem. And um, and oh, there are a lot of algorithms for generating a random. Does that work? I don't want to answer that right now. I'd be happy to discuss it offline. Yeah, of course, not not the right time for that question. But uh, uh, I'd be happy to. Discuss. There are lots of algorithms. I just try to say the standard one. I'm just wondering why at LLAB you wouldn't do that. Well, they, I, I, I don't know either, but uh, I, I told you the one that they used. Right. So it's a, <laughs> that's yet another question. Um, um, so um, uh, oh, um, with Mirdad Shashahani, another longtime friend of, of, of Barry's, we we, we figured this out, uh, and uh, the, the way a theorem comes out uh, is, is this way. Um, uh, uh, 
if, um, if k is 1 half n log n uh, plus c n, uh, c is bigger than 0, I'll explain this, then the distance of shuffling to random is less than or equal to 2 e to the minus c. And this c is the same as this c. And um, uh, what, what, what that means, uh, well, that means if you want to know how many times to shuffle to make this less than 1 in 100, you write equals 1 in 100, you solve for c, and then you put that into here, and that gives you the answer. And there's a lower bound that matches this, right? So um, that was, that was a, uh, no, I don't want to do that. I want to learn how to do this, uh, and uh, then learn how to do that. Um, and so um, that, that's, that's, that's what a theorem looks like uh, in, the, in the subject. I think this is the, the first such theorem in the sense of uh, a sharp quantitative bound. And um, I, around 1985, um, I gave this same talk uh, in this same room. Um, uh, Barry and David Mumford were interested in having somebody in the math department who knew about combinatorics and probability and, and asked me to give a job talk, although I didn't know it was a job talk, but uh, anyway, I did, I did talk about this because I'd I, I, I just written it, written it all down. And oh, I should say, by the, answer, by the way, the answer's around 400, I mean, or, or something like that in order to and, and we know why it's not random when it's not random, and that did explain the, the anomalies in our, in our, in our results. Um, and after, um, after my talk, uh, Barry, as usual, I saw him talk after talk, came up and said, that was great, and uh, thank you, uh, meant a lot to me, still does. And uh, uh, he said, um, you know, but, you know, you know, the reason your argument works is because the set of transpositions is a conjugacy class in the group, and what you're really doing is taking the element in the group algebra, which is the sum of all transpositions plus the identity, and then raising it to a high power. Well, you could do that for any group, you know, any Lee type group. And he was going on and kind of sketching out a program of research, and, and it, we're friends, and, and after about five minutes or something, I said, yeah, but but, but what's the story? Why would anybody care about doing whatever I was just doing on a Lee type group? And, um, and Barry didn't know what I was talking about. And, um, and uh, after, after another five minutes of my trying to explain, he said, I see. He said, what you don't understand is that in mathematics, somebody else makes up the story. <laughs> there's some truth to that, uh, and uh, there's a wonderful history. If you, you know, the character theory that I needed in order to prove this theorem was done by Frobenius for just the craziest reason. You know, is the the determinant of a, of a circulant is a product of linear forms in the entries, and I mean, it just who would care about that? The character theory came out of that, so. Uh, um, Stranger things have happened now. Um, so, but Barry's thought stayed with me, even though I do. I, I told you why I was doing this problem, and um, but I just came. It sometimes takes a while for the ideas to mature. I just came from uh, from six months at MSRI, where. Uh, a, a group of us are doing exactly what Barry laid out, that is, um, take a, a Lee type group, say GLN over a finite field, um, and um, take a conjugacy class, like something like transvections, or any conjugacy class, in fact. Uh, these are all almost simple groups, and, and almost anything will generate. And then you can do the analog, make the random walk, and with a group of very wonderful group theorists who I've corrupted, it's his fault, but uh, I've corrupted them, there's a kind of unified um, uh, result which is um, more or less, uh, but really more or less, uh, that is uh, essentially always, uh, for any Lee type group and any, any conjugacy class, uh, not the identity, etc. cetera, um, the rank of the group is necessary and sufficient. Uh, and in order to, uh, in order to um, have things be random. And, and uh, uh, so 
took a while, but I, I did finally follow. It. And I have no idea why we're doing it. It's just the math is nice. And uh, um, now I want to say, well, let's see, what, what, what else do I want to say about, about this, this particular thing? Um, really, the reason I told it to you is it is my favorite story about, about uh, stories. But um, one thing that came out of this result, just to, a lot of smart people here, um, this particular thing, if I graph it, um, uh, uh, so this is k, the number of shuffles, and this is the distance of p star k minus u, how close we are. And um, this distance that I'm working in is the difference between two numbers which are between 0 and 1. So it's between 0 and 1. And it's 0 if the measures are singular, and it's Sorry, zero if the measures are the same, sorry, and it's one if the measures are completely disjointly supported. And, and what this theorem says is something a little surprising. It's, it, it says that this distance behaves with a sharp cutoff, and this cutoff happens at a half um, n log n. Um, uh, that's, that's where this cut, that is this, this going to zero happens in the second term of the asymptotics. Okay, so if you were to make a plot, and it's an outstanding conjecture in the field, let me say it twice, um, take, take any set of permutations that generate the symmetric group, any way of shuffling that you like, and, um, and start shuffling with them, that there is a, there is a sharp cutoff, that is, there, there is a, uh, this, this cutoff phenomena happens for any generating set, and um, uh, a marvelous um, development that came from, from, from this, uh, we made a theory following what I told you about, which says if you know all about one way of shuffling, if you have very, very sharp answers for one way of mixing things, then, then you can get good answers for essentially any way of shuffling. It's called comparison theory. And uh, it's now a, a, a machine on its own. And using comparison theory, um, uh, Juke, Shirash, and Helfgott, I think in inverse order, uh, um, proved that you know if you pick two permutations at random, they generate either Sn or An with probability well, one, and they generate Sn with probability three quarters. So pick two permutations at random, say a transposition in an end cycle, but any two permutations. Pick two permutations at random. The, the mixing time is of order um, n cubed log n, and uh, that's the worst. And we conjecture um, that um, that there's a there's a sharp cutoff of, of this sort. And in fact, we conjecture it for any 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 set of generators for any finite simple group. But there's just a handful of examples, and this is one of them where we've been able to prove. Uh, that, there, that there are cutoffs, uh, in particular for a transposition in an end cycle, we don't know. Uh, I believe that there's an explicit constant such that n cubed log n plus c uh, is, is, is the right answer, but we don't know. So those are, those are math problems that, that come from, uh, from this development. But more than that, it is, a, it is a typical example of how I get involved in a problem and, and, uh, and uh, and, 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 and what, what, happens, what happens from it. Okay, so that's enough about shuffling cards and you should be happy because I just finished teaching a graduate course on the mathematics of gambling and uh, they had to sit through, you know, four weeks of shuffling. Right. So uh, this is all you're gonna hear about today. Okay, so in case, you know, you're tired, it's the last talk. Wake up, new talk is started. <laughs> Um, so, my second story I want to tell, uh, those of us who have who've been participating, I hope most of us were lucky enough to have heard El Elaine Scarry uh, talk about uh, uh, Plato's poetics uh, on, on Wednesday. It was, uh, it was just made, made these wonderful texts come to life. Um, uh, well, I'm going to talk about Plato, it says it right there, for a few minutes. Uh, and uh, so one of the things that we don't know, so Plato wrote a lot of famous books, the ones that have come down to us, and uh, we don't know what order he wrote them in. 
Okay, so uh, Plato's Republic was written early, Laws was written late, and the others. And it matters if you're a Plato scholar. That is, because he changed his opinion, he, it matters. You know, if you're trying to interpret, well, how, what, how did he come to? So that's a question, how to seriate the, the books of Plato. And um, there's been endless articles written about that. You, you know, well, he used whilst here and while there, and you just can imagine the, the conversations going on and on. And around 19, late 1950s, uh, uh, a Plato scholar named Brandwood um, decided to go get some data. And uh, Plato said that he systematically changed his rhyming pattern over time. And, um, and so what Brandwood did was recorded for every sentence the last five syllables in the sentence, whether the stresses, whether they were long or short. And so, for example, Plato's Republic has a, around a thousand sentences in it, and um, for each of those thousand sentences, uh, Brandwood recorded a binary vector. Uh, it, it was in, in, you know, this kind of language um, uh, of, of length five. Uh, you know, uh, you know, long, short, 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 long. If that's what those symbols mean, and um, uh, and then the notion was uh, the thing that he did and that I did. Um, was let's look at, um, uh, well, so there are 32 possible binary vectors, uh, uh, all, all possible patterns from all short to all long and, and everything in between. And so uh, I, I would have a, a function f of x, uh, if x is a possible binary pattern of length 5, which is how many times did that pattern appear in Plato's Republic? Uh, and in the other books, uh, uh, F of Laws um, uh, of X. And the idea was to look at, for example, Plato's Republic, which we know was written early, and see if these numbers show some pattern. And, um, uh, and then if that pattern is different in laws, we could use it to seriate. Okay, that was the, that was the notion. And um, uh, using I'm not going to say in detail how that came out, but um, if you're interested, I think if you type in Percy and Plato, <laughs> up it will come. That's a paper I wrote with Julia Saltzman, uh, and not quite what I want to talk about, but uh, um, that's an example of analysis of binary data. Okay. Well, there's all kinds of binary data. Uh, um, it could be that I'm looking at a string of zeros and ones, uh, x1 <coughs> up to xk, um, which uh, may be of length 12, uh, which was one or zero as that worker was employed or not in that month. And the current population survey gives me 5,000 workers and uh, vectors of length 12, and then it tells me what f of x is for those workers. And again, you could try to make sense out of, out of those numbers. And, um, or um, well, there's lots of a class of students and you gave them a true-false test and you have how many students had this <coughs> pattern. So there's lots of examples of binary data uh, that one wants to analyze. And um, what I want to get to, so that you know this is the, how it started, um, I want to get to m m my own personal el elliptic curve. So I've got a ways to go. Yeah, that's uh, so um, when we analyze data uh, of this sort, we often replace the data by various averages. For example, um, uh, it might be that I, I looked at all, all I, I sum, I, how many people, be, you know, ha, how many people or how many sentences began with one? How many sentences have a, a one in the i place? How many sentences have, you know, one zero in places i and j, et cetera? So we often analyze such data by taking averages of, of, the, of the different um, uh, functions, uh, of, of the functions that, that come up, and then that, that helps clean up noise and, and, and allow us to make sense. And, and from, from this, um, this analysis, I was led to find a quite simple striking pattern uh, in the Republican laws that were quite different, and when that, we use that to seriate the books, um, the, the, the majority opinion 
was vindicated, I'll put it that way, and uh, it has had some impact on, on <laughs> this tiny little area of, 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 of scholarship. Uh, the fact that some math also pointed in the same way as, uh, as, as other arguments. Um, okay, so if you, if you have data, so I'm now suppose we're given one x, one, one function on, on binary k-tuples, and um, uh, you are going to take certain averages of it. And um, so I'm going to specify a class of averages. Let S be uh, a subset of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, 2 to the k, a, sub, a fixed subset of, 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 of uh, k-tuples. And then you could uh, define the Radon transform uh, f bar of y, so I'm given f, and y is uh, a, a binary vector, and this is uh, the sum of f of, um, uh, of, f of x um, uh, for x uh, in s plus y. So s is something like a ball, and what you're doing is, is taking your function and averaging it over, over the, a ball around y. That's a kind of common thing one will be doing for a second at any rate. And, um, and so you replace your data or by, by some smoothing of it. And now a natural question, if you're doing stuff like that, if you're massaging data in that form, um, is, well, am I, can I, have I captured all the juice in the data? Uh, well, one pale version of that is, given a bunch of averages, that is fix an S, uh, for example, and suppose I tell you all of these averages, can you reconstruct F from it? Or is there something hidden in the averaging process that is now invisible uh, to you? So, uh, so a kind of math question is given uh, uh, S and uh, uh, F bar of Y for all Y, uh, can we reconstruct Um, F. Um, and uh, this is, is the Radon transform invertible in this situation? And um, there's, there's no shortage of, of, uh, of math and developments about, about properties of replacing a function by its averages over a collection of sets. And this is one that, that came up for me that I was interested in. There's many other things, but I want to get to my favorite elliptic curve, and I've got to go pretty directly to it. Um, and so um, uh, let me um, uh, tell you some news. Uh, the news is bad news and good news. Okay. So the uh, first piece of bad news um, is that, um, uh, uh, well, first of all, the, the, the good news is, uh, to start Barry's conference, to start with good news, uh, um, if, if the size of S is odd, you can always reconstruct. Okay, that's not hard to see, and it's true. <laughs> um, but sometimes you can reconstruct it. It's important to reconstruct when the size of S is even. And, um, and uh, Okay, well, the first piece of bad news is that for most uh, sets S um, uh, of size um, uh, 2, 2K, uh, y you can't reconstruct, uh, you can't. Uh, so the radon transform isn't, isn't invertible, and uh, that's uniformly in K, actually, okay. Um, and, uh, uh, Here's the second piece, I'll keep it down here, maybe you won't be able to see it. Uh, a second piece of bad news um, is given a single S, and you can ask, given it, uh, can you reconstruct? That problem, it's a yes or no question, that problem is NP complete. Uh, so, okay, so there's not gonna be some simple algorithmic way of doing it for, for, you know, for, for general S, so that's, Maybe bad news of a certain sort, um, but um, but here's some good news uh, 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 for for many natural S's because typical S and you know 
worst case s, of course, the could, trouble could happen. Uh, but for many natural, many natural, natural uh, s, uh, it's okay. That is, uh, you're not losing any information. And the class I'm going to tell, the class that led to an elliptic curve, um, was uh, balls in the Hamming distance. So uh, let uh, S uh, uh, be equal to the set of all X, such that the number of ones in X is less than or equal to R, say. Okay, that's a, that's a, a ball, fixed ball, a, uh, where this is the number of ones in X, the Hamming uh, metric. And um, so suppose I, I replace a function by smoothing it. Um, uh, can you reconstruct it? It's a, a math question that came up in the middle of doing the analysis. And um, uh, so now it starts to depend on R. Um, uh, so, okay, so um, uh, it starts to depend on R. And um, so I have two parameters now, the diameter of my ball and K, uh, the length of my vectors, right? And um, uh, so when R is one, so everything within one of me. Uh, uh, it's okay uh, if and only if um, a k is um, odd. Okay. Well, so uh, that's a theorem. Anyway. Um, when r is two, so everything within two of me, well, you can reconstruct um, if and only if um, k is not a square. So mostly, you can reconstruct. Okay, that's that's good. R is three. Uh, uh, it's okay uh, if and only if uh, k is uh, odd and not a square. Okay, it's getting more and more okay. Um, and when R is bigger than or equal to four, um, okay, just slightly bigger balls, um, it's okay. Um, uh, it's okay that as you always have your re reconstruction, um, uh, except for finitely many k. Okay, so that's already uses some classical piece of number theory, uh, but it's not okay. So I started in working on the question of well, all right, what happens with four? I know that there are only finitely many bad values of k. Can I find them? What's it about? And I want to just write down what this has to do with anything, so let me write it down. Um, so when r is four, um, it's bad. Uh, that is, you can't reconstruct, um, uh, if and only if. Um, uh, this polynomial, z to the fourth minus twice uh, uh, 3k minus 4, uh, z squared plus 3k times k minus 2 um, has an integer 0, uh, integer 0, um, uh, 0 less than or equal to, you know, less than or equal to k. So there's a Diophantine type condition. Um, uh, the, the k's which are bad are the k's such that this is the fourth Krachuk polynomial for people who like orthogonal polynomials, and um, uh, that's when, when you can't um, reconstruct. Well, okay, this is work done with Ron Graham, who then had a team of programmers, and we went to the computer, and, and so, uh, so the bad values, I'll, I write hmm here, uh, so what are the what are the bad values of k? Well, it was bad uh, bad for k equals one, uh, two, three, eight, eight, seventeen, um, sixty-six, uh, one five two one, and um, uh, fifteen thousand forty-three. Okay, so sometimes it was bad. And we looked pretty hard, and, and we thought, well, is it possible that that's, that's all? Now, for those many people in this audience, this is essentially a, an elliptic curve. And so let me write it down that way by an elementary transformation. 
figuring out, so I have, I have two parameters, this Z and K here. So this is, um, uh, let's see here, I went up. And this can go down. Um, so just to try to make it look more like something this audience might relate to, um, uh, this is equivalent, equivalently, um, uh, this is the curve y squared is equal to 6 x squared times x squared minus 1 uh, plus 9. And if you prefer Weierstrass form, uh, u squared is equal to 4 v cubed minus 57 v um, uh, plus 53. Uh, so you needed to find integer solutions of, 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 of these equations. And, um, and we know that there are only finitely many. Um, and, and it's a question about whether we found the largest one or not. And it's just a little corner of work. But I was very pleased to have an elliptic curve that I met on my own terms without somebody saying, well, this is a famous thing. There it came. I mean, I just came from seriating the books of Plato. Um, and uh, um, uh, so I, I went to Barry and I said, hey, I've got my own elliptic curve. And he kind of looked at me, but we're friends, so he listened up. And, uh, and, um, and uh, he got very, very interested in it. And he put the word out, whatever that means, but you know, if Barry calls you and says, and I asked him, why are you so interested in that curve? Thank you, of course, thank you. But why are you so interested in that curve? And he said, you know, curves that come up in nature from some other cause that aren't number, you know, often have a way of reappearing. And, you know, curves that, that actually come up in a real problem deserve respect. And I, thank you. Uh, uh, and, um, through a chain of events, but it really did start um, start with uh, Barry, and I wrote their names down, and I'll mispronounce them, but let me at least try to say it. Um, uh, Stoker and De Vager, uh showed that we found all the uh, all the uh, integer uh, solutions. That that that's the that's the except for this list of k's, you can always uh, invert the rate the rate on transform when uh, when you are averaging over balls of of, of size four. Anyway, it's, um, it's a little kind of corner thread of applied math, but it was one in which Barry really did make a, make a difference. Um, there are papers, well, okay, it's, it's actually not easy to show that you found all the solutions. Maybe it's easier since they did it, but uh, okay. Um, so again, I would wake you up, but you were all awake anyway, right? So here comes the third talk. And um, this talk, um, uh, this is about wandering around on the streets of Paris. And um, uh, here's how it goes. Um, so I'm interested in many things. I have some talents. Language is not one of them. Okay, so there I am. I was teaching at Orsay, living in Paris, and wandering around. Because you walk, and you walk, and you walk, and you walk, and you walk. But I, you know, it didn't, my French is just poor. And, uh, and so I, you know, I noticed I was using an algorithm to maneuver around, not a map, of course. Uh, but, I, you know, oh, that way. I went that way before. I kind of recognized it. I'll go that way. That is, um, I, I was wandering around the streets of Paris using the algorithm that streets that I walked more in the past, I was more likely to choose in the future. And let those of us who have not done such a thing cast the first stones. And um, <laughs> at some stage, uh, uh, I decided to try to make a math problem out of that. You know, how can I, that sounds like something I should be able to mathematicize. So let me tell you what I did. Um, uh, uh, let's take the simplest case. Uh, let's take a triangle. Here it is. A, B, C. Okay, and I'm gonna put weights one on each of the edges. And imagine a random walker who starts at A and then picks B or C at random, maybe he goes to C. And every time he crosses over an edge, he adds one to the weight of the edge, okay? And when you're in a new vertex, you pick where to go with probability proportional to the weight of the edges leading out of you. Okay, so that's what I was doing. And I just said it as math, right? And so now the question is, what happens? Okay, just, it's a triangle. 
Uh, so let's see what would happen. So here, two thirds of the time I'd go back, so maybe I'd go back, and now I'm here again, and now three quarters of the time I go back. So one natural thought is, you wind up dying on an edge. You go back and forth, and that's what you do. Okay, that's one natural thought. And the second thought is, well, it can't matter what happens at the beginning, you wind up spending a third of your time at each vertex. There's the, those are the only two natural guesses, and both of them are wrong. And, and so there's no natural third guess that I, that I could think of. And, um, but it's a simple enough problem that it must yield to thought. I mean, it's just a triangle after all. And um, I kept thinking I'd see it. And eventually I blasted it out and it was hard work. And, um, and I, I want to tell you a, a sentence about it. First, let me tell you the, the sort of bottom line of it. So again, if, uh, if n a b is the number of times I cross a b after n steps, and I look at n uh, b c uh, n over n and n uh, a c. So this is the proportion of times I've crossed each edge. Um, so this is a, 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 a vector on the simplex, the numbers that sum to one. And um, prove that this converges uh, to a limit, a theta 1, theta 2, theta 3, on the, on the unit simplex. And um, as uh, n goes to infinity, almost surely. So, um, but this limit is random. So if you started with a fresh triangle and you did it again, you would converge almost surely, but the, you know, the limit where you converge to is, is different. And each time it will be different. Uh, and so I, you know, then it's a natural question. Well, there's some limiting probability distribution on the simplex. And I know lots of them. My community knows lots of them. And I did figure it out. I'm going to write it down in a second, but it's nobody's friend. <laughs> so it was, you know, not, not one of the standard ones. I, I just write it, write it down. It's, it's not far away. I almost remember it, but um, let me. Uh, so um, uh, this is, uh, well, OK. The, the limiting density, uh, this has a, a continuous density. Uh, it was uh, xy plus xz plus yz uh, to the 1 half um, divided by um, x plus y um, times um, x plus z to the 3 halves uh, times um, uh, y plus z uh, to the three halves, uh, and uh, this pi is a normalizing constant. And here, um, uh, I guess th this is x, this is y, and this is z. Uh, those are those are so. So it's a funny. It's a funny. Uh, it's a funny density. And I, I once was at a. I once was at CCR, and I said, I'll give a hundred bucks if anybody can show that this pi is the right constant. You know, it's an integral over the simplex, and why does it integrate to pi? And some guy at the end did it, sitting there in the car, Richard's dong, and I, I paid the hundred. That was the hard part, is to get him to take the hundred. Anyway, um, uh, so this is the limiting uh, proportion of time that you cross the, uh, the, um, each, each edge, and some funny, funny um, limiting probability uh, distribution. Now, um, so, let me just say this. Uh, the same story I just told you is true on any finite graph. Uh, so if you take a graph, it could be a square, it could be any kind of finite, say, simple finite graph connected. Um, you start random walk with reinforcement. That is, you put one on all the edges, and you, you, know, you move. And every time you add, you add one to the edge. Um, the same story is true. That is, the proportion of times you cross each edge tends to a limit. That limit has a density, which is absolutely continuous. And there's an expression for it, which is a little bit worse than this. But it's worse than this in an interesting way. Um, the description of the limit uh, uses the first homology group of the graph, pi 1 uh, of, 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 of the graph. And um, it's the only theorem I know about in, in probability that where anything about homology comes in. And uh, I'd be happy to be corrected. Uh, about that, but um, uh, uh, now what does that have to do with Barry? <laughs> uh, so um, 
as part of our long conversation, um, I have often tried to teach Barry probability, how to think a little bit like a probabilist. And it hasn't been easy. <laughs> uh, um, so one of the ways that I tried is um, I said, well, you know, and he wants to learn, we speak all languages, and uh, including mine. And so I said, well, next time I'm, you know, in the middle of some problem, you know, we can do some calculations together so you get a feel for what it's like. So let me say a sentence about what uh, is behind this. Um, uh, this random walk with reinforcement, that's what it's called, um, uh, is, um, uh, generates a stochastic process. So uh, x0, where you are, say that's a, and then there's x1, x2, etc. Right? So if you wander around, you know, where you are is random, and I'm called, giving them names, calling them x0, x1, x2, etc. And, um, and I guessed from examples or from having done things like that for years that this process for any graph, um, this process what's, was what's called exchange, partially exchangeable. And um, uh, let me try to explain what that means. Um, so uh, if you take two possible realizations, so all the strings will start with A, but uh, well, let me, so if, for example, suppose you start A, B, a, um, B, C, B, A. Uh, that's, that's one way your process could start. Right? And another way it could start um, is uh, if I switch these two blocks, B, C, B, A, B, A. So I just took this block and this single block and switched them. That's all I did. These two strings have the same transition count matrix. That is, if I make a counting matrix, uh, here's A, B, C, A, B, C. How many times in a string did I go from A to B, et cetera? Well, it's zero along the diagonal. How many times in this string did I go from A to B? Once, twice. Uh, so from A to B, I went twice. From A to C, uh, no times, OK. Uh, from B to A, once. Twice, okay, etc. Um, let's well, we can just do it from B to C. I uh, went once, uh, okay. From C to B, uh, C to A, C to A, zero. Um, one, okay, so that's the transition count, and um, this string has the same transition count matrix. Okay, and you can get that's if and only if you can get from one string to another by switching blocks of, in, in this way, and the claim is that. For random walk with reinforcement, if two strings have the same transition count matrix, they're assigned the same probability. Okay? And I verified that in small examples and thought it was probably true, but I hadn't actually written out a proof. And, uh, and I said to Barry, and we were walking back from the Science Center to his house or something, I told him the story, and he said, well, let me try that. I'm going to write it down. And the next day, he wrote out a two-page proof, an honest, you know, combinatorix, probabilistic proof of that for any graph, a graph that random walk with reinforcement is this is called partially exchangeable. Well, I built a machine in, um, in somewhat before that, which is called Diffinetti's theorem for Markov chains, and um, uh, so this condition is called partial exchangeability. So partial exchangeability um, is equivalent. So a process is partially exchangeable. Um, is equivalent to it being a mixture of Markov chains. That is, uh, uh, if and only if for every n and all x1 up to xn, uh, the probability um, uh, assigned to x1 up to xn, uh, the probability that your process goes through this string, I suppose it starts at, at a fixed point, is equal to the integral over the simplex of the product of theta ij to the ni uh, ij uh, mu d theta. Uh, uh, so here, this is the a simplex. It would be the three simplex if I was working with a triangle. But it's the simplex of all uh, indexed by the set of all edges. And um, so the claim is that partial exchangeability is equivalent to there existing a measure on the simplex, fixed measure, such that for all possible strings, 
the, the chance of seeing that string can equivalently be said uh, as uh, pick a transition matrix, pick a Markov chain from this probability on Markov chains, and, uh, and then run that Markov chain. It's Definiti's theorem for, 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 for Markov chains. So his calculations allowed me to use this theorem, and then knowing that there was a limiting measure, it's the only first way we knew that there was a limiting measure, uh, I could then use the existence of a limiting measure to calculate by combinatorics what are the chances, and, 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 and this is, this is, um, this is what, what, what came out. Um, so that's a, a third example, uh, and so one part of this talk, of course, is and as much as I am an applied mathematician, uh, statistician, uh, you know, what do we do for a living? So I've given you um, three examples. Uh, um, you know, they're mostly problems that come from some real world uh, connection and uh, shuffling cards and analyzing binary data and, uh, and well, uh, walking around the building, uh, in many cases, even though you've done a specific problem uh, that came from an application, if you take the math seriously, something happens. Um, uh, in particular, um, I'll tell you one sentence of what happened from this triangle problem. Um, of course, you can do this on any graph, so take an infinite graph, um, like take the integers. And so put one on every edge of the usual graph of the integers, a random walker starts at zero, and every time she crosses an edge, she adds one to the weight of the edge, so there's a restoring force back, and when you're at a new vertex, move to one of the vertices adjacent to you with probability proportional to the edge weights. Um, and uh, uh, ordinary random walk on Z is recurrent, you come back to zero infinitely often, so it must be if you have a restoring force, must also be recurrent, and uh, that's true. It wasn't so easy to prove. It was Robin P. Mantle's thesis at MIT. Um, but um, in two dimensions, uh, it was open for 30 years. Um, it was my most famous open problem. Uh, that is, is random walk in two dimensions with recurrence, is it, it, is it is, with reinforcement, is random walk recurrent? And finally, um, uh, Christoph Sabot and, and, and Pierre Therese proved that it is recurrent. In fact, it's recurrent on any lattice. Um, just to give you one more sentence about that, if you take an infinite tree, our favorite object, uh, 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 anyway, the infinite binary tree, it, do random walk with reinforcement. Um, uh, if you add one each time, it's not recurrent. If you add five each time, it is recurrent. And five is the square root of some you know, solution of the transcendental equation. So there's a phase transition. That's another result of, of, uh, of Robbins. Um, and so th it's an interesting problem, and it, it came from this. Well, the breakthrough came because um, the measure, my crazy measure, this mu, uh, you can't see it, but uh, there it is. I didn't, didn't write it down. But this mu, which involved the homology group of the graph in, 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 in interesting ways, had been studied by physicists, um, Tom Spencer and Martin Zernbauer, um, for doing supersymmetric string theory. And in a he an unbelievably long, hard piece of analysis, they figured out enough about this measure so that we could do the asymptotics that we needed. And then <laughs> they got interested. They'd never heard of Diffinetti's theorem or this way of, but it's the same measure that came out. And why is that? And there's a very healthy interaction between between a group of physicists and a group of probabilists. And if you're interested, it'll be uh, an, uh, an AIM workshop uh, in about nine months from now uh, on, on the interaction. Um, these are three instances of how Barry helped one, uh, one uh, person in applications. I bet that everybody in this audience, at least those of us who know Barry, have, uh, have a similar story. It would be interesting to try to, to bring them together. Uh, I'm going to end with a warning. I don't think I've successfully ever finished teaching Barry probability, but we're both still around. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs>